So today I'm going to talk about complementarity, which is both a specific topic in physics, but also something that has, uh, as a general idea, much wider applications uh, to uh, the way we look at the world. In fact, the essence of complementarity was expressed before its use in physics by F. Scott Fitzgerald in this quotation, which is that the first, the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. So we'll be greatly elaborating on that thought. In physics, in quantum theory, uh, the complete description of a system is its wave function. But we can't observe wave functions directly. And this leads to uh, a very interesting situation, which is the physical version of complementarity, which is a theorem in quantum mechanics. Uh, it's so uh, the wave function is the primary reality, but we don't have access to the wave function directly. We can only ask questions of physical systems and answering different kinds of questions can involve different ways as, of processing the wave function. And the amazing and profound thing is that uh, the processing involved to answer different kinds of questions are often mutually incompatible. Let me uh, show you that uh, very specifically and concretely in terms of equations. Uh, this will be the only set of only slide of equations in, in the in the uh, in the presentation, but I think it's very important to uh, know that there are equations that go with all these words. So the uh, fundamental innovation of quantum mechanics is to promote the dynamical variables that describe physical systems into operators. And the operators don't necessarily satisfy the ordinary rule of multiplication. Uh, for instance, the operator that uh, represents position and the operator that represents momentum, X and P respectively, satisfy the famous commutation relations, which were sort of the original innovation in Heisenberg's first paper on quantum theory uh, that says that X times P minus P times X, that's the commutator, that's the notation on the left-hand side, equals of all things, the imaginary square root of minus one I uh, times H bar. The, the Planck's constant, but for uh, uh, ease of notation, I'm using units in which uh, we measure action uh, as multiples of Planck's constant. So Planck's constant is one. Now, as a consequence of that non-commutativity, that fact that X times P is not equal to P times X, you find that doing measurements of X interferes with doing measurements of P. And here's the proof. So this leads to the famous Heisenberg uncertainty relationship. We, uh, and if, if you can follow this derivation, that's great. If not, just uh, admire it in awe. Uh, they, so if you look at the uh, square of the vector, which is X times I times a quantity lambda that we're gonna allow to vary times P acting on any state S and square it, uh, then uh, you get this thing. We're taking the square of a complex or a vector in a complex vector space. So we have to move over to the, uh, dual vectors and complex conjugate the, vari the uh, dynamical variables. And uh, then expanding it out, we meet uh, X times X. We also meet P times P. 
But then we also meet uh, terms that would ordinarily cancel. Uh, if you were just dealing with numbers here, this would be x squared plus p squared. But uh, because x and p don't commute, according to the fundamental principles, you get an extra term. So this expression, therefore, which has to be uh, greater than or equal to zero, is got uh, not only things that look manifestly positive, but also this extra thing that can be negative. And if you require that this quantity always be positive, it tells you that uh, this equation regarded as, or this expression regarded as a quadratic expression in lambda had better not have any real zeros. Because if, that, if it has a real root, a real zero, then going just beyond it will make it negative if it was positive or positive if, if the quantity was negative. So uh, if you remember your equations for uh, quadratic, for solving quadratic equations, you'll find that the condition that this quadratic expression has no real roots is that one quarter is equal to or less than the expectation value of x squared times the expectation value of p squared. So that tells you that uh, you can't simultaneously have definite values for x and definite values for p. They, they have fluctuations which uh, have to multiply to a, a certain non-zero minimum. Uh, and uh, this can be a little bit sharpened if we have situations where the x has a non-zero average, we, would, we could subtract the average value of x or subtract the average value of p and everything would still go through. Just putting in num numbers that commute with uh, the operator expressions here doesn't uh, interfere with the derivation. So that's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which as a mathematical fact in quantum mechanics is very basic to the central uh, assumptions of quantum mechanics. But sort of begs the question, uh, this that does the quantum mechanical framework actually describe the world? What physical reality reflects that theoretical limitation, if any? Uh, quantum mechanics is not uh, is not handed down from heaven, or is not 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 logically necessary. Maybe, maybe there are ways around it in, in the physical world that uh, show that this whole framework is unsound. In fact, Einstein thought so. And this was the subject of a very, very ser uh, famous series of debates involving Bohr and Einstein. This is Bohr and that's Einstein. Uh, enjoying themselves, I think, at a hotel in Brussels, at the Salve Conference. Uh, and uh, Bohr wanted to maintain the truth of quantum theory, and Einstein wanted to destroy it, because Einstein did not like the idea that you could not have a very dis a completely definite description of the world in which both the momentum and the position were under control. So fluctuating these sort of minimal fluctuations in uh, one or the other was very much uh, something that he didn't like. And he proposed a whole bunch of experiments, thought experiments, that uh, he thought would enable one physically to do exactly what quantum mechanics says you can't do, that is measure position and momentum at the same time. And this in conversations extended over several years, Einstein proposed one experiment after another, very ingenious ones, getting more and more ingenious. Uh, and then, uh, but Bohr would shoot them down one by one. And uh, ultimately he shot them all down. You can read about this in a classic 
description by Bohr of this series of discussions with uh, the, showing the details of Einstein's thought experiments. That's, for instance, this one, I won't describe it, but you can see that it was ingenious. Uh, and uh, it, I think uh, uh, anyone interested in the foundations of quantum theory or of how physical reality works and how Bohr and Einstein saw the world uh, should, should look at this uh, classic account of the debates. So uh, the answer which emerged from these discussions uh, has, in physical terms, I think, uh, three parts. This, this, these, these are the kinds of things that, uh, in, in, special, in different cases, concretely, Bohr showed, uh, voided every, every one of Einstein's thought experiments. First is that when you observe something, it's like you try to observe a position or try to observe, observe the momentum of a quantum mechanical particle, uh, you must interact with it. And uh, it's a general truth, not having to do with quantum mechanics, is that intrusive interactions changes the thing being observed. It's almost the definition of intrusive. But what, what uh, occurs in the micro world described by quantum theory and reflected in, in concrete physical phenomena is that when you have delicate objects, very small objects, discriminating observations are unavoidably intrusive. If you try to do fine enough experiments of position, you do things like shine uh, short wavelength light on the particle, you locate the particle within a wavelength and scatter it. But uh, because, of, because of photons, that they carry a minimum amount of energy uh, associated with the shortness of their wavelength and, and uh, therefore they can disturb the system. And that, that uh, anal if you carry that through uh, mathematically, uh, you find that everything is consistent with uh, these, un uh, with the quantum mechanical formalism and in particular, the uncertainty relation. So that's, quant that's uh, complementarity as the theorem, if you like. You have to take into account different ways of processing reality that might be even mutually incompatible if you want to do justice to all the possible questions that you might ask about. And we don't mean airy questions about vague stuff. I mean, what is the position? What is the moment? Uh, let me give some user-friendly examples of complementarity, though, which if we try to extend it beyond its original domain uh, as a theorem in quantum theory. Uh, I should say that Bohr popularized or attempted to popularize uh, the, the, the concept of complementarity as a general philosophical principle, a way of seeing the world that he found and I found, I find uh, very uh, uh, congenial. And so that's recommended as a kind of wisdom. <clears throat> so let's look at some user-friendly examples that are less abstract than thinking about position and momentum. So here's a thought experiment that's kind of a minimal version of complementarity. Suppose you have objects these are strange objects that uh, can be measured either to have shapes or to have colors. But uh, if you measure the shape, then uh, either color is equally likely. You lose information about the color. And if you me measure the color, uh, then you lose information about the shape. This we saw is in fact a representation of polarization of light that if you measure along the vertical axis, you lose information about the diagonal axis, vice versa. But uh, here it is sort of less abstractly. And you can see that uh, according to Einstein, 
there are pre-existing objects that have both colors and shapes, but uh, according to quantum mechanics and Bohr, you can't assign uh, both color and shape to the objects at the same time. You can measure one or measure the other, but you can't measure them both at the same time. There's no underlying reality. You get into contradictions if you think there's an underlying reality where they have both color and shape. Here's a even more user-friendly version that uh, now is getting sort of outside of physics, but uh, uh, begins to show how complementarity can be applied as a piece of general insight and wisdom. This was pointed out to me by a musical friend of mine, uh, Mina Polanen, and she said, well, uh, we have complementarity in music. We have harmony and melody. Harmony is what's going on at one time when you hear several different notes coming together. Uh, melody is the sort of the line of notes that uh, is a global characterization. And if you're paying close attention to the harmony, you lose track of the melody. And if you uh, pay close attention to the melody, you sort of suppress the harmony. Now, if you listen to the same piece several times, or if you're a very talented musician, you can sort of keep these things move back and forth very fast, but they do tend to interfere with each other. This, by the way, is remarkably close to uh, the complementarity that occurs in quantum mechanics. If you look at wave functions and position space, then you have things that happen at a definite time, a definite position, and that would be like the harmony. Whereas to get uh, the answers to questions about momentum, you have to process the wave function. Technically, you have to take a Fourier transform. So you have to take global processing of the wave function. That's like the melody. Uh, here's another user-friendly example. Is it a rabbit or is it a duck? Well, <laughs> if you look at it along the, uh, the, the duck axis, it looks, I think, pretty convincing like a duck. If you look at it uh, along this axis, it looks pretty convincing like a rabbit. Is it a rabbit or a duck? Well, it depends how you ask. Someone showed this example to the Dalai Lama and asked, does he see a rabbit or a duck? And he said, I see both. Yes. <laughs> Now, so now let me uh, talk about some more ambitious candidates for complementary, complementary thinking. One that Bohr himself liked to mention was the complementarity of truth and clarity. Uh, Bohr was a notoriously poor lecturer. He mumbled and would go off on tangents. And, but uh, if people, uh, uh, sort of called this to atten his attention, he would say that's the, that's the complementarity between truth and clarity. The reason that I'm so unclear is that I put in all the qualifications so that my statements can be rigorously true. I don't know if that's really an adequate explanation, but that he was very fond of this kind of joke that truth is complementary to clarity. And there's some, you know, I'll let you think of applications of this complementarity. I think you, you will, they will come to mind. Think about politics, for instance. Uh, the, um, and in physics, there's a, um, famous approximation, consider a spherical cow, which very much illustrates this complementarity between truth and clarity. Uh, to get a truthful description of a cow, or for that matter, any complex physical system becomes very, very difficult as soon as the system gets anything except the most simple kind of model. Uh, so uh, in the interest of getting clarity, 
we simplify, we make drastic simplifications and uh, sacrifice truth uh, in order to get clarity or compromise, I shouldn't say sacrifice, but compromise on, uh, on the detailed truth in order to get uh, clarity. Another one I think uh, is determinism and free will. Uh, the equations that we use in modern physics with great success to describe the world are deterministic equations. They tell you for sure what happens uh, if you know the state of the world at one time. Now, the state of the world involves wave functions, so you actually have a hard time determining the wave function, but if you did, you, uh, mathematically, you could evolve forward. So there's a, uh, there is a sense in which it's deterministic. Uh, but we all experience free will. I mean, we can decide, you know, we make choices all the time, and we look around at other people, and we think they make choices, and our systems of law and way of dealing with people is really based on the idea that we do make choices and have free will. So both are definite features of reality, but they seem to be in conflict. I don't think they really are in conflict. They're just different ways. They're ways of addressing different kinds of questions. And so complementarity uh, can really help. Uh, let me say a few more words about free will and how it might be in fact uh, consistent with a deterministic uh, underlying uh, reality if you ask different kinds of questions. This is a, a profound experiment uh, by Benjamin Leibet. I think that goes back into the 1960s. In any case, there've been many, many follow-up experiments of a, of a similar kind of, uh, of greater sophistication, amplifying, and confirming uh, the basic uh, insight uh, that, that comes from this experiment. But the original experiment is very, very is, is simple to describe. Uh, so you had a subject here that uh, was asked to do a very simple task while uh, their brain was being monitored. So, so you can see that. So, and uh, the task that the subject was asked to do was simply to press down a button and record the time when he or she decided to press down the button. So there was a, a special kind of accurate clock that they could be looking at and uh, that, that they would look at and, and, and correlate with when they decided to, uh, to push down the button. And at the same time, uh, the, 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 uh, so that's recorded at the same time, also the brain signals were recorded. And what was found remarkably is that <clears throat> there's about a half second gap between uh, the time that people recorded making the decision and the onset of uh, activity that ultimately leads to pressing down the button uh, within the brain. So before the subject thinks they're making the decision or is aware, uh, uh, the decision is being made uh, under the hood, so to speak. Uh, So this, uh, okay, it's, a, it's strong to say that this shows that uh, determinism is more fundamental than, than free will, but it does seem to indicate, and later experiments uh, reinforce the conclusion that what we think of as consciousness and making decisions is actually uh, uh, our brain functions being reported to us at, at, reported to our consciousness, but, that, 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 uh, but the things have already happened elsewhere. <laughs> Interestingly though, uh, there is some, uh, so 
that undermines free will. But on the other hand, there is a free won't if, uh, if the uh, experimenter sees this activity starting and shouts, don't press the button, and the subject can not press the button. So, there's a, so uh, there is the possibility of intervening uh, in, in, in this uh, otherwise determined, uh, but apparently choice action. Okay, nevertheless, if you ask questions about responsibility, about how, and if you interact with other people and try to make sense of what they're doing, uh, you definitely need the concept of free, some, 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 some such concept as free will. And, uh, yeah, so the, you, so this, uh, Calvin's way of, of uh, avoiding responsibility for everything, I think is, is really not the appropriate conclusion to draw from the fact that the equations of physics are deterministic. <laughs> but if you ask why, I think you, have, you get into these considerations of complementarity. In order to do justice to different kinds of questions, you have to use different kinds of concepts. And this generalizes to the whole idea of matter and mind. We have, I think, at least I do, I, I assume that other people do, the, uh, the feeling that we uh, have minds that, that sort of are not located anywhere. <laughs> we don't have the, 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 the uh, feeling that we're located somewhere. And yet uh, there's, and, and uh, and that has, have a kind of autonomy that exists in a sphere that's different from, from matter. This is closely related you know, to the question of determinism and free will. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, from the point of view of uh, neuroscience and, and fundamental physics, uh, that perhaps underestimates the potential of matter. This is a little section of the hippocampus of a cat. Uh, drawn by the famous neurologist Ramona de Cajal uh, using the method called Golgi stains, which selectively stains about one one thousandth, one one thousandth of the cells and then stains those completely so you can get a picture. It's also using a very, very thin slice. So it drastically underrepresents the complexity of the hippocampus of a cat and you can get, and each of these cells is a significant information processor that takes in input from all these dendrites and then feeds it to further processing. And, uh, and so you shouldn't underestimate what this kind of arrangement of matter can produce. And in fact, we have sitting on our desktops mostly, uh, very significant information processors that do impressive things that will beat you at chess or go. Uh, and yet we know exactly how they're made from matter. And they make it also very plausible that mind emerges from matter. Nevertheless, to answer questions about how people think and cognitive science, uh, we don't necessarily want to go back to the equations of physics. We want to use concepts that are uh, appropriate to psychology. And so answering different kinds of questions requires different kinds of concepts. This is a, a piece of visual poetry by John Wheeler and nothing I could add to it. Nothing I could say about it would add to it. So I'll just let it, let it admire that. And I think uh, finally, along these lines, there's another famous confrontation between uh, science and non-science, physics and non-physics that uh, is, I think, also 
uh, an issue where different kinds of questions require different kinds of approaches and they can seem to be uh, in mutually incompatible, but in fact, they're just different ways of processing reality. And uh, famously, uh, you can never, according to David Hume, I, I certainly agree, you can never uh, go from answering questions about what is to questions about what ought to be. You can never uh, go from questions about what is to what should be, what I ought to do. And so uh, to answer those, is, those kinds of questions, we need different concepts and different uh, ways of reasoning than, uh, than we use ordinarily in science. Okay, so there are lots of uh, places where complementarity has force. It has the force of a theorem in quantum theory that puts limitations on how much we can measure. Uh, but I want to emphasize that it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily an insuperable barrier to mind expansion. Because although you can't answer both these questions at once using the same concepts. No one stops you from using, answering one and then answering the other and synthesizing. And in particular, if you can go back to the same object and study it over and over again and gather more and more information at different times, you can get uh, a complete picture or at least a richer picture. In particular, in, in quantum mechanics, we calculate wave functions. We can't measure them, but we can calculate them. <laughs> and in principle, if we calculated them, you can use calculations to answer different kinds, all different kinds of questions. And then there's no, no issue of uncertainty. So, so a first rate mind keeps these pictures, keeps these different aspects, different perspectives in mind and, and, uh, at the same time in mind at the same, a first grade intelligence keeps them in mind at the same time, I think. F. Scott Fitzgerald is really onto something here. Uh, so here is an example of measuring, of looking at position and momentum. You can take a function, doesn't have to be a, quick, a brain scan, but this is what I could find on the internet. It could be uh, uh, the quantum mechanical wave function in position space of a hydrogen atom in some excited state, for instance, take its Fourier transform, and then you have the tool that you need to measure the possibility, the possible not positions, but the possible the probabilities of different kinds of momenta. So doing the math, math, doing these different kinds of processing, if we have enough information, so if we've done many, many measurements, uh, or if we've done different kinds of measurements, we can have information that's complementary that we could not gather both at the same time. That's fine. We, uh, you know, what is, Walt Whitman said, I am large, I can take, contain multitudes. It's perfectly possible to expand your mind and consider different points of view. Uh, despite uncertainty relations or on, despite uh, the necessity to take into account complementary views that superficially look contradictory. Uh, I think this has tremendous potential for the future and I want uh, to uh, recommend it sort of as, as, as we come to the conclusion of this lecture series as a direction some of you young, young people might want to pursue is nowadays we can uh, actually take several points of view at once. We can present on a screen, as you just saw, you can present the position space and the momentum space at the same time. You can do lots and lots of things you can, you can at the same time. And uh, the idea that I really love that will heighten the contradictions and be very, very interesting to understand the nature of consciousness is to look at your own brain as it were, as it happens. Uh, the technology for doing that kind of thing is getting there. If you go to this very, very interesting website, 
the Brain Navigator, uh, you'll find that uh, this is a project funded by Paul Allen. Uh, the, uh, you can look at slices uh, of the brain at different times. I mean, if you had several screens, you could do these all at once. And in the future, when you can do dynamical measurements, you'll be able to have animate, you know, the animation of what's actually happening inside. And so you will, I think, uh, not tomorrow, maybe not in 10 years, but uh, within a, a finite number of decades, it will be realistic to look at your own mind in action. And what would that mean? What would that, what, what, how, would, how, would you, uh, how would you react to Leibniz's experiment if you lived through it? I don't know. It's certainly uh, interesting to think about. <clears throat> So finally, I want to uh, come back to melody and harmony and I end this series of lectures on a high note, or actually lots of notes, literally, by showing you how it is possible to have both harmony and melody in mind at the same time if you open your mind to broader representations. And this is from a quite wonderful website that I uh, highly recommend. I don't know why it's not showing here. It's mu musenim, so it's musicalanimation.com. Very simple to, rep to, to uh, there it goes, okay. And here, with the help of the kind of thing, you can absolutely see and hear melody and harmony at the same time. Okay, so that was melody. Here comes harmony. In anticipating the thing, that's going to happen. I want to thank those of you who've, who've attended uh, this, this series of lectures. It's been really fun to, uh, to uh, give, give uh, this kind of, these kinds of presentations of a very, very broad nature where physics, fundamental physics meets uh, reality <laughs> and points to the future as well as uh, current frontiers, as well as profound lessons that, that we've, uh, we've gathered so far. And um, if, if you have an appetite for more, <laughs> I will be giving uh, in approximately one week, is it exactly one week? Uh, the, the Weinberg Memorial Lecture on Monday, I will be giving uh, in Austin, Texas, <laughs> a, uh, uh, a lecture called Quasi Particles and Quasi Worlds, which is you'll you'll be ready for, and uh, which is very much in the spirit of these lectures here. This is the first Stephen Weinberg Memorial Lecture, and uh, we'll send you the link. And I hope I hope you enjoy it. If not, uh, uh, it's it's been fun, and I, and I look forward to our final question session coming up. Thank you. <clears throat> Since since we're since that was a short lecture, I deliberately want to give extra time also to people uh, from afar on the web if they have can type in questions. Maybe we can try to handle a few in real time before we adjourn to the the, the class questions upstairs. Oh, okay. So apparently.
for technical reasons, the, uh, the link to the Bohr-Einstein discussion was blocked by some nonsense. So let me... I'll just drop it into the chat so you can see it. Uh, other questions? Do you have any? Uh, I don't see any in the chat room. There are many, many people, but they're not asking questions. So I guess it was clearer than I thought it was. <laughs> yes. Um, oh. uh, so the useful choice would be either Yes. Right, you couldn't know the Microsoft uh, Yeah. Now, of course, we've got now the Yeah. Yes. I wonder if that I think that was a poor piece of generalization. As Paul, Professor Paul Day, uh, pointed out that one of Niels Bohr's proposed applications of complementarity was uh, the idea that if you try to find the secret of life, so it was kind of, it was very vague, somehow that uh, 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 understanding life is impossible because just because the measurements you'd have to make uh, would kill whatever it is you're trying to uh, uh, find out, but, but Biology has made a lot, a lot of progress since then, and no such, uh, no such limitation, no, no, clear, no such clear limitation has been found. And uh, the, I, I mean, I think maybe part of the idea that that motivated his speculation was the idea that intrinsically quantum mechanical processes were really vital to how life works. Uh, but we're, we're by intrinsically quantum mechanical processes, I mean uh, processes in which quantum uncertainty, the, the difficulty of measuring really precisely because of the limitations of quantum mechanics plays a role in biological phenomena. Uh, of course, the world is quantum, so biology ultimately depends on quantum mechanics. Chemistry depends on quantum mechanics. It's hard to know what it would mean to say that biology doesn't depend on quantum mechanics. However, uh, the, uh, the uncertainty aspect of quantum mechanics doesn't appear to be uh, a limitation, a practical limitation to uh, understand biological systems. In, bio, in, in order to see the small effects of quantum mechanical fluctuations, typically you want to work with systems that are very, very cold and very, very isolated, uh, but life is not like that. Living things are not like that. It's a, it's a warm environment that's open to the world and thermal fluctuations and, uh, fluctu and fluctuations due to interaction with unpredictable aspects of the outside world seem to be much more important than any conceivable quantum mechanical fluctuations, quantum mechanical effects. Uh, although there are people who try to uh, uh, associate uh, quantum effects with, uh, with uh, biological phenomena, Roger Penrose, who uh, is a hero of general relativity and recently got a Nobel Prize for theoretical work in general relativity, proposed that uh, consciousness is intrinsically linked to uh, quantum gravity of all things, and points to 
uh, mitochondria as a place where quantum mechanics might not. Uh, tube, yeah, I'm sorry, microtubules, not mitochondria, microtubules, or maybe microtubules within mitochondria. I mean, microtubules as a place where important quantum mechanical effects uh, might show up. And, uh, we don't understand quantum gravity, so maybe that has to do, and we don't understand consciousness, so maybe. And, uh, but most professional biologists and most professional physicists and I are not impressed. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, I couldn't. So there's a question here. Uh, I couldn't hear over the video. What was the music an example of? So let me repeat what the music is an example of. The music was an example that I talked about earlier of harmony and melody being, or melody and harmony being things that uh, are difficult to process at the same time uh, because one is local if you like in time the other is global property of, of, of the thing uh, and uh, and uh, but but by bringing in our visual system and being able to scan things both globally and locally at the same time that you can transcend that limitation That's, and that is a way of enriching your experience especially of complex polyphonic music you can see how it works see it see it, see it in action uh, okay there's another question how does complementarity apply to entangled particles it gets more complicated, but this, the principle is the same. That is that there are aspects of the behavior of entangled particles that uh, you, you can measure to answer different questions, but you can't do them both at the same time. So we even had that for one particle, as I, as I showed, when you have uh, photons and, and their different polarizations. Uh, when you have entangled particles, it's it's the same thing in, in principle, but more complicated. And you, you can show behaviors that look even stranger and more uh, paradoxical on first encounter than, than the behavior of photons. So I, I, in another, I saw, uh, so I can't, okay, without going into a lot of technical details, I can't do uh, much more justice to that issue. But uh, another part of this question from Barbara Temple is, uh, is it possible to measure a little bit about momenta and a little bit about uh, uh, positions without, without uh, uh, with, at the same time? And yes, you can, you can measure mixed quantities and get some information about both. But if you want to get really accurate about position, then you have to sacrifice momentum. If you want to get very accurate about momentum, you have to sacrifice position. But if you're willing to sort of mix and match, you can do better. And there's a very, very interesting uh, and uh, vibrant field in, in, at the frontiers of quantum technology to figure out how to uh, optimize measuring one thing or another. So uh, this, this leads to things like squeeze states that have a lot of, uh, lot of uncertainty in position, but very little momentum or vice versa. Uh, and, uh, and not only position and momentum, but things like phase and number and things that are of great interest if you want to detect gravitational waves or axions or do sensitive measurements, you can optimize to try to avoid quantum maneuver around quantum uncertainty by focusing on the right things. Okay, another question here. Maybe this is the last question I should take before we go upstairs. Uh, do you subscribe to the view that evolution and intelligent design are complementary? Uh, well, 
Okay, so intelligent design is a uh, loaded term that uh, occurs that is uh, associated with a kind of particular uh, religious uh, fundamentalism. Uh, and uh, usually, uh, and it's, it's not, well, it's not clear to me that the questions that it is designed to answer are questions that need to be answered. So let me leave it at that. Uh, but to make the answer more interesting, let me bring in an, a more general concept of intelligent design that some of the people who espouse it, I think would be appalled to, to think that they're doing intelligent design, but they are, if you think about it just a moment, the people who talk about the world being a simulation, like in the Matrix movies, that is intelligent design. <laughs> it's literally intelligent design. Somebody designed it and, and there you are. Uh, and uh, again, I'm not sure that answers any question that needs to be answered. Uh, it doesn't, uh, but, but it, it's, it's certainly uh, something that uh, uh, would require uh, uh, different ways of processing information about reality. Uh, yeah. I, I haven't thought about this, so I don't know how to relate those ideas to complementarity. Uh, but, but let me say about that idea that we live in a simulation is that you can think of ways of testing it and it's just wrong. Every time you try to think of a way of testing it, it's wrong. If, if the world is a simulation, it's really stupidly programmed, very inefficient. It's not, uh, it doesn't, the, the way the world works using a continuum using very, very complex building blocks that if we look at them carefully, they're really, really complex. Even protons are very, very complex. Yeah. This is not the way you would make a computer program to do uh, complicated, interesting things. So, so no, it doesn't, it doesn't to me, uh, it doesn't look at all like, uh, I mean, it's logically possible that, that you could imagine creating worlds inside computers that, that fact, you know, people who design computer games do that and they're getting more and more sophisticated and eventually maybe the characters will have minds of their own. <laughs> but, uh, but if you ask, is our world that, it sure doesn't look that way. And if, if it is that way, it's a very, very poor design. 